We have thousands of people who go missing every year just here in the United States, and there's no discrimination on the missing. They are young, old, black, white, male or female, even children. It's time to stop. 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 Hello guys, welcome to Chasing a Murderer Talking News. I want to ask you guys to subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell if you would like notifications whenever you have new uploads. So this is part two of the um, podcast, Feel the Fire, and that's run by Melanie Gibb and Lori Vallow. Their guest speaker is Chad Daybell. So as always, I'm going to open with a few of the leaders of the LDS let you hear a few things of what they hear growing up and of course it's going to be up to you what you get from this I'm not going to persuade you one way or another but I'm trying to find a reason as to why all this started in the first place and where their minds are you know where what is Lori and Chad thinking what did they grow up thinking did this have any effect on where they went in their future how it, you know, did it affect this case? Is this the reason for it? What exactly is the second coming? And where does this second coming, the fear of it, where is it rooted from? Is there truly an end day coming toward us right now? Because after all, Lori really felt as if this was happening in our time in her time, in your children's time. Tribulations and signs of the end times were earthquakes, destruction, and war. Listen in. Dispensation and the list of hurricanes, typhoons, and blizzards worldwide show similar increases in recent years. Increases by comparison with 50 years ago can be dismissed as changes in reporting criteria. But the accelerating pattern of natural disasters in the last few decades is ominous. Another sign of the times is the gathering of the faithful. In the early years of this last dispensation, a gathering to Zion involved various locations in the United States, to Kirtland, to Missouri, to Nauvoo, and to the tops of the mountains. Always, these were gatherings to prospective temples. With the creation of stakes and the construction of temples in most nations with sizable populations of the faithful, the current commandment is not to gather to one place, but to gather in stakes in our own homelands. But to gather in stakes in our own homelands. Okay, so that, I feel, is important because Chad is listening to this and he obviously I'm not certain where he heard this from but he heard it from one of the LDS leaders I'm certain and he took his own message from this and began to build his own land preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ there the faithful can enjoy the full blessings of eternity in a house of the Lord There, in their own homelands, they can obey the Lord's command to enlarge the borders of his people and strengthen her stakes. In this way, the stakes of Zion are for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without measure upon the whole earth. Okay, so I feel like this is important that you understand what Chad and them are learning and literally how they take these things 
and how this is going to affect their future. But so far, there hasn't been a leader in the church that has said that they supported Chad or supported his idea that the second coming is coming this moment. The president of the LDS church is the main prophet of this religion. So, he has to say so, or she, to alert their people and prepare if a second coming was to arise. But something I did notice is they do kind of flip-flop and kind of contradict themselves at times. But I pass no judgment. The only reason I do this is to find out why Chad and Lori are doing what they do. So we will continue the second part of the podcast of Feel the Fire, where they are talking about Jesus Christ. And Lori is interested in Jesus Christ personality traits and she seems to get extremely excited about it there's a few other people involved with these podcasts that they're making and so those people are jason mao david warwick and there's a few others now i'm going to start a little bit back and cover a few things i didn't cover last video so it's important i want you to hear where chad or pay attention to when chad is talking about how the leaders um, that is part of Jesus Christ, I, ha I got to say group or posse. They're giving him warnings about the future, and he and his children are mentioned as being involved. But Tammy, his wife, is never talked about, not once. So how interesting is that to you guys? And I know it's interesting to me. Why is Tammy not a part of the future ever? As I said, in his books, he mentions Tammy at the beginning a little bit. But as the future moves forward and we get later into the 19th century, Chad's books only speak about him and his children mainly. And all these visions include his kids. Oftentimes, a lot of times involve his children. And everything revolves around his children, supposedly. I just get this feeling that Chad sees Tammy as a vessel for his children and not a wife. And that hurts. So if you're not familiar with this story, you're probably lost right now. So I suggest you go and start watching Life Beyond a Grave. Start with part one. And then come back to these videos. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. And we're going to go back just a little bit. So let's go. Starting off with a vision with Chad and his children talking to Jesus and the leaders. In the future with the Savior and also my children talking with him and that he's the real living being that he will come again and I hope we can live the way we should that those visions I was shown can happen. So, what do you remember your feelings being like with him? Like, being shown that, like, you were like his friend, you were like talking with him, you were working with him? So, Lori is very interested in how close Chad is to Jesus Christ. So her question actually focuses on how close he's saying he is to Jesus. Is he your friend? Are you working with him? Using the word like, like a valley girl. Or many of you that watched a Chris Watts case when it broke, that was probably one of the main topics, how he used the word like so often. So it seems that Lori is also um, infected with the like epidemic. And it seems to be a lot of people, for a lot of people, it's a pet peeve. But she's, she says, like, are you friends with him? Like, you know, are you working with him? And each time I notice that Lori asks a question, Chad has this very awkward pause. And a lot of you have commented on this pause and given your perspective or reason as to why he might be doing this. But it is interesting. Why is um, 
you know, Lori's question is so complicated. So listen closely as we move forward in this podcast. And it just kind of seems that Melanie Gibbs, the the third wheel in this, when the reality is it's kind of named after her book, Field of Fire. It's, I don't know, it's just something very strange. Sorry about that, guys. That was uh, the wood stork shaking his feathers. So that was my bird, guys. Sorry about uh, Woody. He's noisy. But doesn't it seem like Melanie Gibb is that third wheel and so Lori and Chad have their own thing kind of going and what Melanie says doesn't seem to mean anything to either one of them. This seems to be their own little world. And Melanie's, for some reason, is just existing. And listening to Melanie Gibb um, speak on the podcast, she's a lot more, she approaches it in a professional manner, while uh, Lori and Chad seem to, well, especially Lori, seem to be kind of childish and giggly and um, having a good time. Now, something I want to point out as well is Lori has is always talking about Jesus. This is her life. This is the main I mean, this is what's in her brain. Everything's about Jesus, what he looks like. So, what's going on with that? What's the relationship? And what is she really thinking? So, we know in part one, Chad describes that Jesus has an organization. And this organization is to help him, his family, and friends around the area out of all these stakes now remember this wards that these other uh, gatherers are gonna be camping Chad is directly working with Jesus preparing for the second coming because it hasn't come yet and he points out many many times and that's something I want you to keep in the back of your mind and is telling Lori and this is important I think uh, again I'm gonna point that out when we hear Melanie ask questions, she seems very direct and very serious. So, here we go. Let's continue. Be able to help him, and he'll be appreciative of us as we raise our families in righteousness. And he was glorious, and just as I said before, the paintings don't really demonstrate the full power he has and the feelings you have when you're next to him, uh, just uh, radiant light comes off of him, and yet he, you can see his face clearly, it's not like he's obscured by uh, glorious light, but he just radiates happiness, there's a, a joy in his eyes that you rarely see in anyone else on this earth. Okay, so he's describing happiness and joy, but his tone doesn't really show this feeling that he's describing most people they're going to talk about joy they're going to be like i was so excited this was amazing to be honest chad sounds like he's boarding well he's boring himself and all of us too if you're going to be happy and you're going to have these emotions and jesus is going to emit this great uh, or radiate this great happiness enjoy you're most likely gonna feel it and I just thought that was kind of important to understand Chad and that most likely he's really not connected to Jesus like he's explaining he is he's attempting to uh, be close to Jesus and understand the emotions but very disconnected and a smile and a laugh that <laughs> kind of erupts Kind of from his chest, you know, it's not just a giggle or anything, it's, mm -hmm. it's a full-hearted laugh, and he, it's a happy, happy laugh. Let's hear it once again. It's a happy, happy laugh. For me, it seems that he doesn't, I don't think he's ever experienced true happiness. He really seems to be kind of lethargic when it comes to emotions. I realize as we get older, we kind of don't show our emotions as younger people do but this is complete lack of 
don't forget to put your comments below on what you think put the time marker on the video and tell us what you think you feel like a, a brother but also we recognize that he is a heavenly being but he was organizing us to build this city and to help the rest of the world come to understand the happiness that could be theirs. Did it give you a sense of peace as you saw those upcoming events, as he worked with you and others? Did it give you a totally different sense? Because most of those ideas might be a little troubling to see and witness. We see how Melanie Gibb relates to the fact that they might have struggles because they're going through a tough time if something like this is happening. They're losing everything. Chad does have awkward pause again, but it's not quite as bad as when um, after Glory asked a question. Okay, so let's hear what he says about, you know, how people are dealing with this loss and this devastation and also to them this would be a glorious time uh yeah it was a feeling of peace for, for sure everyone had been through some really tough times just getting to that city required so everyone had been through some really tough times but it's peaceful very interesting combination so i'm doing a brief catch up if you can't tell we're kind of doing an overview of the first part of this podcast and now we're going to be leading quicker into the second part so remember Lori's interest in christ's personality traits and what he looks like do you also feel like what are like some of his personality traits because i'm interested in like obviously he was powerful but like a calm power or what do you what are your ideas of his personality traits so a podcast is meant for the listeners usually but Lori's turned this into an I thing so she says I'm interested so that's very important as well to pay attention to and we're going to learn that Chad believes and he pushes the idea that he is closer to Jesus like I said in the first part which kind of puts him in that leadership role which makes sense now right he kind of singled me out a couple of times and <laughs> as if we knew each other pretty well mm. and for them to have hope that that can happen for them because most people like you said do not feel worthy or they're hard on themselves or they, they have this unbelief and I, maybe you can describe more about a way to believe in him um, just from your experiences with him that would help other people have hope that that can happen for them i wanted you to notice um the approach in this podcast with melanie gibb that she's saying there's hope for other people she's mentioning you know others whereas Lori's already fascinated with her ideas and her ways she's not concerned about other people and i think that's also important to understand her personality and why she's driven a lot of people are concerned with this baby voice they say Lori has so this says a few things for Lori and according to the NBC News baby talk is a sign of emotional closeness because it brings you and your partner closer together when you let another person speak to you as if you're a child it means you don't need to put up your defenses around them and instead you can behave in the same way you did when you were young so is this a sign that she feels very comfortable with Chad uh, because she's speaking to him like this not Melanie because she's not even speaking to Melanie in fact it's like Melanie isn't even there so is this a sign that she has her defenses down because she feels comfortable with her partner a lot of people think that she's trying to be cute or sexy trying to seduce someone is it social anxiety she have trouble relating to people i think she does and um, this is apparent by um, her closed groups no lori does seem to have some disruptive behavior disorder 
She has frequent temper tantrums, excessive arguments with adults, refusing to comply with adult requests, always questioning rules, refusing to follow rules, behavior intended to annoy or upset others, blaming others for misbehavior or mistakes, becoming easily annoyed with others, frequently demonstrating angry attitudes, speaking harshly or unkindly to others. Um, one of the number one traits she has is behavior designed to seek revenge. She also has like a conduct disorder, which is usually attached to young adults, children. She has aggressive behaviors towards others, including bullying or making threats, misinterpreting others' behaviors as threatening, inability to tolerate frustration, restrictions, or rules, chronic lying without remorse, stealing or destroying property, if you remember Charles fighting says substance abuse but she, we know she doesn't as far as we know do drugs and so some of the more serious behaviors resulting from conduct disorder can include using or threatening to use weapons like threatening to kill Charles abusing or mistreating animals which she doesn't seem to have any signs of abusing animals but she certainly doesn't bond with them and physically attacking others. While she might not be the main attacker, she is quick to have someone else do it for her. So these signs or behaviors have been introduced to the court throughout her entire life. And it's something that they say these kind of behaviors should be taken seriously, but for some reason is never taken seriously. That is possibly one of the reasons for her baby talk. So there's two reasons she uses baby talk in this podcast is I feel that she's trying to seduce Chad. She also feels this partnership with him. And so it's very interesting as to why she's doing this baby talk. And if you will share below why you think she's doing it, perhaps maybe you know a little bit about psychology or you are a psychology major, please share below. We'd love to know what you think. I would absolutely love to know what's going through Melanie Gibbs' mind um, when Lori's speaking on this podcast, especially in that severe baby voice. So let's move forward a little bit. Just get to know the Savior himself, and then those experiences will occur. I love that. Can you also describe for us, like, what he looks like? I always want to hear it. I love that. Can you also describe for us, like, what he looks like? I always want to hear it. I don't know about you guys, but that's a creepy, creepy um, way to address a podcast and Jesus Christ himself. What he looks like to you. I've seen him, it's been in a glorified form. I haven't really had a vision of him when he, at least a clear vision of what he looked like when he was on the earth. And, but So what I've always seen is a future version, I suppose, or his current version of the resurrected being, but he, he has blonde hair. Uh, not blonde. <laughs> 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 yeah, right, at least. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, Maybe lighter than expected. <laughs> well, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so my visions of Jesus are fairly clear, especially the visions I had of him in the future. He did have longer hair. It was when I saw it almost to his shoulders. It wasn't a buzz cut or anything. Mm-hmm. And I'd say he had blue mm-hmm. eyes. Definitely radiant, but they were so powerful and piercing that, you know, they were almost crystal clear in some cases, it seemed, but blue seemed to be the standard color. Mm -hmm. Uh, A little olive skin. I think we sometimes think resurrected beings are just white all all over. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But, yeah, he definitely had color in his eyes and his hair was brownish it wasn't dark brown kind of a light brown and the version I saw he didn't 
have much of a beard. I I know that he can change. He's just like a mortal. He can probably change his hairstyle. And decide to grow a beard. Mm -hmm. It's all up to him. But in that form, he, he didn't have much of a beard. He was fairly clean-shaven. And mm -hmm. I know that's not usually how people picture him, but um, he was wearing a, a robe. It was kind of a tan robe. And every time I'd seen him, he'd kind of be out among the people, and that just seemed to be what he preferred to wear. And just almost casual, I guess you'd say. It wasn't really formal clothing, but a robe. And then and I remember his hands, they did have the marks from the cross still there as a symbol of of his sacrifice for us. And one scene I was shown, he, he did hold out his hands for my grandkids to actually touch the marks in his hand. And he, he would just smile. He wanted them to remember that and that he had paid the price for their sins and that they could live with him for eternity. I felt that he was encouraging us to to just be like him that he didn't have to be on a huge pedestal to reach him or anything that he was right there among us he is the savior of the world and is a perfect man but he doesn't want us to feel lower than him and he serves and wants to be the servant of all I love that. Can you, you said that he was like joking with you. Is that like more like telepathy speaking, like spirit to spirit? Or was that more like, like talking to you and like joking, like friend to friend? Yeah, <laughs> in the future scene that I described there with the grandkids, it was verbal. I mean, he just, he did stand up after hugging the kids and and just made some funny little comments, you know, humorous, mm -hmm. not like telling jokes, but just uh, a dry humor, I suppose you'd say. <laughs> he can see the the light, the lighter side of life. Um, it, it seems like he was commenting about one of my granddaughters who seemed really shy and he just kind of whispered to me something like she's sure a cute girl and doesn't need to be that shy or something like that. <laughs> so she did feel his love and warmed right up to him. Obviously everyone did. <laughs> this all occurred on a plaza by a temple, by a holy building. And it seems like we knew he would be there and we gathered there that day and he came out of the building and, and greeted us and seemed to know us very well and so that was that made it a lot you know, easier to to just chat with him but i don't know why i was shown that particular one other than it did show his kindness and love towards everybody everybody was eventually able to at least embrace him or shake his hand. He'd usually just kind of do a kind of a bro hug with the man. <laughs> you know, just do that. Dude to dude. Hey, man. <laughs> That's funny. Because he's a real person. Like, he lived a real life and like we do, and he's a real person. and He relates to us. Mm-hmm. More yeah, than we think he does, because we think of him as a heavenly being and not like us. Mm -hmm. Right, untouchable, kind of, um, you know, no humor at all. This is what we portray him sometimes, and that's right. it's just not accurate. And I think what we need to remember is we're here on Earth to become like him. And he's setting the example that we can be ourselves and, and laugh and... Mm -hmm. enjoy life and sometimes the Puritan way of life where it's all serious and and no 
humor at all. It's not the way that Heavenly Father and Jesus are. Mm-hmm. There's laughter in heaven all the time. They're mm-hmm. very happy there. Mm-hmm. They There's have sometimes. joy, right? Joy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which they're inviting joy us to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, they do experience sadness when they see people make bad choices, but overall they're very happy and want us to succeed and become like them. And so I believe as we advance to heaven that we'll be best off if we can have that kind of humor and that happiness in our lives as well and not be judgmental of others. That that was one thing that really stood out to me was he just was not judgmental. There was no doubt you can hear the excitement in the girls when he mentions the fact of joy and happiness and greeting Jesus all in heaven. And so you can tell that this does mean a lot to Lori. This is something a lot of people were kind of on the fence about. They were like, I'm not sure if um, Lori is so much into this religion that she's using this religion to get what she wants. Well, it seems to me, in my opinion, that it's probably both. She truly does love Jesus Christ. Does she love him as much as she loves herself? I don't know. But it's it's very evident she does adore him. As for um, Chad Daybell, some of us are wondering if he believes in anything he's saying. After all, he's making a shoe load of money um, off of this belief system and heaven, the end days, all of these things. So we hear that Chad was talking about writing Um, books, continuing to write books, but he was going to change the direction. Listening to these podcasts, it sounds like the direction was going to be persuading people to come to certain areas to prepare for the second coming. All right, guys, let's listen in. The love there that said, I accept you as you are. Mm -hmm. Do the best you can. Don't judge yourselves too harshly. Mm -hmm. That's one of the biggest things that I felt, Chad, was when I had my experience with feeling that love is, I felt no judgment. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. It's really good news that he feels like that. (laughs) Because he's a being of love. Why would he spend time taking you down? His his whole goal is to uplift you and exalt you. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. I just know how eager he is for all of us to return to him. He does love us individually, as hard as that is to comprehend with the millions of people on earth. But he knows each of our names. He he'll communicate with us now if we'll let him. Um, there isn't a, a block between us other than what we create ourselves. And we just need to seek out this Jesus, as they say, mm-hmm. and let him become a part of our life. And then he'll be there the analogy that the Savior never moves. It's whether we move far from Him or if we move closer to Him. And we just need to move closer to Him in our daily lives. And step by step, and we'll find ourselves right there with Him. Whether it's in this life or once we pass over, if we've lived a good life, He'll be right there to greet us. And we'll know Him. And when you take part in, in the atonement that he offers us, then mm-hmm. you have part in him and, you know, you'll know exactly. him. Exactly. That's an interesting comment that she makes is to take part in the atonement. We know that Jews and Israel and many other religions uh, affiliated to Christianity do continue to take part in atonement, meaning that there is a sacrifice of blood, the shedding of blood for God, or in most cases, people say that Jesus was crucified and atoned for our sins. So therefore, you have no atonement to continue. But there's clues that say that there's a possibility that Chad and Lori both are supporters of continuance of atonement for sins.
And a lot of people sus are wondering or suspect or speculate, is this why Tylee and JJ are no longer here? I continue to search for proof, but right now I don't have enough put together to really point that direction solidly anyways. But there is a suspicion of some sort that possibly they did have some sort of ritual for these two children. After all, these videos are here to uh, raise awareness, push justice, and to show that you don't forget until the justice is served. So I would love to hear in comments below, what do you think that she meant by participating in this atonement? So here you go. According to scriptures, sin must be paid for. When Jesus Christ died, he suffered as a substitute so that you don't have to do such things in the place of and on the behalf of the fallen humanity. So Christ thus made it possible for men and women to be declared righteous based on the faith on him. So when Lori says take part in atonement, what does this mean? So a lot of people suspect that they believe that people need to die for their sins, not uh, except that Christ has already done that. And that's where I'm worried about where this case is going to go because they're going to be worried how to... This is a touchy situation for the church and for the country. How do you go to court for something like this? You know, how do you address this? And the majority of these, uh, of the people that will be um, actually pursuing justice for the children are LDS. And I will go into greater detail with my um, my series that I have on the atonement and everything, but I'm just kind of doing a brief summary here. That I am very concerned with the word choice of taking part in atonement coming out of the mouth of Lori and being agreed by Chad Debo. And who is sitting beside them when this is said? Well, Melanie Gibb. I mean, think about it. She didn't say... You know, how can we use atonement in our lives? Which is where they repent, change, grow, or become better people by applying atonement, not taking part. Oftentimes, Christians are baptized by a person that holds the authority of God and then, therefore, applying atonement. To take part in an atonement depends on the sacrifice really it does and also you can kind of look at it as it's some kind of justice that they're seeking i also want to mention before i forget that um it just seems that Lori has some kind of love for jesus and we kind of wonder if it's um love in a hot jesus sense which a lot of people including myself, have never heard that term, hot Jesus. But it is easy to, uh, the, the term is easy to understand as what it is referring to. It really is, does Jesus have an impact on women more than a um, perfect human and example? In this podcast, we have discussed already that Lori seems to be very excited and I'm um, always curious about what Jesus looks like. And this is something she admits is a topic in our household daily. So, is this Lori look at Jesus as a hot Jesus? So, there's a lot of women that have a crush on him. After all, he is the perfect man symbol of humanity with a perfect body perfect everything if you look on the internet there is just ridiculous amounts of inappropriate pictures of jesus christ well sometimes even in movies he is just portrayed as a more of a physical being than a godly being 
Remember, one of the last days that JJ is seen, Lori Blaine's are um, says that JJ was climbing on the cabin tree on the refrigerator and knocked over a picture of Jesus. If you listen to interviews by babysitters, nannies, and friends, family, there's always a picture of Jesus in Lori's house. It seems that Lori is infatuated with Jesus. And a lot of people are trying to figure out how Chad fits into Lori's life because he really doesn't look the part to fit in her life, does he? So we'll talk more about this in Life Beyond the Grave as those videos start to upload. All right, so we'll continue with the podcast and pay attention to Lori's enthusiasm on the subject of what Jesus looks like. Him and you know, you'll know him. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. I love that. But to be clear, his eyes are crystal blue. Is that correct? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, crystal blue is the best <laughs> description, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the people want to hear. They want to know. Yeah. It's a big debate at my house <laughs> because oh. of all the different <laughs> portraits. <laughs> it's a big debate at my house. And they may not have been blue when he was on the earth. Is that what you're saying? This is in his resurrected right. state. Right. Yeah, his, I was seeing him in his resurrected state, and that's what I saw. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And that he is our friend, and that he is like ahead of us in eternity but got had mm-hmm. gone through all the things that we're going through now so he perfectly understands how hard this life is the mortal life and that's why we want to have you sorry that's why we want to have you on chad is because we want people to know that the savior is reaching out and wanting others to come unto him and let him change them and right. so grateful for your testimony and Lori's testimony and my testimony and that he changes our lives and can bring us joy if we will only but let him and believe in him so here i want to remind you that this is a testimony so this is something they believe is real these visions are true and they are going to happen. So these visions with Jesus and his personal meeting of Jesus and his being pointed out several times by Jesus are, is him saying that he is going to be part of that clique. And they all seem to be on cue. But again, I want to mention that Tammy doesn't seem to be involved with any of these plans in the future. And so that's kind of Concerning that should raise red flags the lack of hearing his wife's name. Right. Well, he's often referred to as our older brother, and I've, I'm the oldest brother of five, and I can relate to that feeling <laughs> where you do want to just help your siblings out. You don't want them to make mistakes. You do your best to help them when you can, and that's the role he's playing with us. We did atone for our sins and is our savior, but now that older brother is just reaching out to us and, and loves us so much that we can't even really comprehend how much he loves us and wants us to be with him in his heavenly home someday. And I think that's exactly what Satan is trying to, to do, is to convince us that he is not loving, he's not approachable, and he's playing um, that adversary there to keep us away from that love and light. And so we have a lot of false traditions and a lot of false ideas about this Jesus whom we seek. And so we are here to bear testimony that this Jesus is approachable and he's loving and he's kind and he wants all of us back. And we need to overcome those false traditions by sharing. Mm-hmm. The good news. He, because he is real. We want people to know that he is real and a real person. Yes, I testify he's real. <laughs> he, he does appear to people. And he does want all Christians to succeed and, and follow what he taught. He learned from his father what to teach the, the world and and that is the plan that will help us return to live with our Heavenly Father and with Jesus. And there is really no other way. That is the way and the truth and the life. And that is going to 
Help us find true happiness. Yes, thank you that so much. Awesome. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. And that you concludes. You're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We want everybody to feel the fire, the heavenly fire, that you can be encompassed in his love. That's right. And That's Phil, wonderful. and we want to just share again, as we hope that all can feel the fire. And thank you for listening today. His Okay, so the irony in this case is just probably one of the biggest ironies of all humanity. They are a group supposedly seeking love, repentance, walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ himself, who is a man of forgiveness and love trust and these guys do not display any of those traits all right guys i'm gonna go ahead and end it here because i've worked pretty hard getting a lot of videos out here and i want to take a bit of a break i want to say firstly that don't forget we have girls out there still missing you know please take time to show the families that we do care about the children that are missing, the women that are missing out there, and even the men. I love you guys. I appreciate you watching, liking, and commenting. And now that I've finished part two of this podcast, I'll start back to putting together part 11 and 12 for Life Beyond the Grave. All right, guys. Have a great week. See you soon.